Good afternoon. I am Monica Swante, the Children's Director here at Mississippi Boulevard. Welcome to another live book reading from our campuses here at Southwind. We have the author, Alice Faye Duncan, with her book, Opal Lee, along with Miss Lady Bridget, to do a live book reading for you. We hope that you enjoy, and we look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Thank you. Take it away, Lady Bridget. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. I am excited, good afternoon. I'm excited to do this virtual book read with you today. Now we are still in the month of February. So you know that means that we're celebrating Black History Month, but guess what y'all? We celebrate Black History Month every day at the Boulevard because you can't talk about history without talking about the contributions of African Americans. And as you all know, when Miss Monica and I and the Children's Ministry, when we do a virtual book read, it is important and significant for us to always include Black authors. Why? Because it's often the case where Black authors are not highlighted and they don't get the attention as others author, as other as other authors. So we will always bring to you a Black author and highlight their work. Now, today's author is amazing. And what makes it even more incredible is she is a Memphis native. She's from Memphis, man, as y'all would say. She is known across the breadth of this country for the work that she does. And today, the book that she is sharing with us is called Opal Lee, the true story of the grandmother of Juneteenth. Now, you guys know when we grew up, and I'm not going to tell you my age, but I'm, I'm not as young as I really look. They didn't talk about Juneteenth in, in school. So I think it is very important that children's book today tell the history of not only of where we're at now, but where we have come from. And you're going to hear her read this book. She is a national board educator. She is a writer. She is a children's book author. And she has been a librarian, y'all. Get this. For 29 years with the city of Memphis. She is committed and her passion is telling history through children's stories. And we'll find out why she wants to tell history through children's stories in a couple of moments. She is a graduate of the University of Memphis and also a graduate of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And today she has decided to join us and we are thrilled and delighted that she has taken time out of her occupied agenda because she's a busy woman, y'all, to tell about this book. She's going to read this book with us. She's going to answer some questions. So as she reads this book, y'all write down some questions and put it in the chat box because she's here to answer these questions. And your questions may not relate to this book. Perhaps your questions may relate to something about writing or relate to another book that you may have some questions on. Perhaps your questions may be about what motivated her in her career. She is here to answer these questions. So without further ado, y'all, I just love her. Perhaps she is the most jazziest, fashionable librarian we've ever seen. Because, you know, we always have this image of librarians who are just, you know, they wear it all black and their, their glasses are just, you know, black and, they're, you know, very studious. But y'all, she is, she is fashionable. She got it going on. And she loves to remain relevant, not just with those peers in her career, but remain relevant to the people that she's touching and reaching, the children. So, Miss Alice, say hello to the people today. Hello, hello, people from Mississippi Boulevard. And thank you, Minister Turner and Minister Swansea for inviting me to be with you during this Black History Month. Let me stop uh, you right there. I'm not a minister. The Lord ain't called me no, to no, preach. No, no, if he no, did, I didn't get that phone minister. call. Let me, let me, no, 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 stop. The, nope, stop. You are a minister because a minister is a servant of God. And well, that you I am are a servant of God. So in reality, all of us are ministers because when we get up every day, we are in the service of the Lord doing what God has ordained us to do. All right. So carry on. Now, what were you saying? Okay. Okay. That I agree with you on. I am a servant of the Lord. And at, the, at Mississippi, Mississippi Boulevard, Disciples of Christ Church, we believe in your Christian walk with Christ. It is about um, serving others. Um, right. And Alice, I forgot to tell you that Alice is a child of the king. She is a believer. She goes to renewal of faith of the mind, Re renewal of the mind church. And her pastor is Pastor McGee. But before we get into this book, read uh, Miss Alice, tell me what was your motivation for writing this book? 
Okay, so let me tell you what happened in, or let me remind you what happened in 2020. So in May of 2020, we know that there was a lynching that we all saw on television, and it was the lynching of George Floyd. Yes. But we also know that that next month in June, uh, we saw Opal Lee, grandmother Opal Lee, who was walking across the nation in an effort to bring people's attention to making Juneteenth a national holiday. Yes. Excuse me. Now, America was on fire because of the rage of George Floyd and the lynching of him right? America was on fire. But yes. above that rage was the light, the love, and the and the, the plea from Miss Opal Lee to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And so because of what was happening with George Floyd, it sort of illuminated and um, um, illuminated and caused everyone to listen more closely and intently to what Opal Lee was trying to do. And that was unite America under the banner of Juneteenth. Opal Lee says Juneteenth is unity, right? Juneteenth mm -hmm. is unity. Juneteenth is not just a black holiday to celebrate when the 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 enslaved in Texas heard that the proclamation, then that the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed. Opal Lee says that when we think of Juneteenth, we should look at it as a sign and a symbol of the possibility of liberation movements all over, all over the world, right? And so yes. that then, every, everybody, uh, particularly African-Americans, were so enraged because of George Floyd that then they too wanted to help Opal Lee in her campaign to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And it gained attention in, in Congress, in the Senate. It gained attention in states all over the nation. And so by the next year, 2021, Juneteenth was a holiday. But this is what happened for me and how I came to write the book. The publisher at HarperCollins knew of my work from Memphis Martin and the Mountaintop. That's my very popular, in fact, that's my most celebrated and most famous book at, at this time. Memphis Congratulations. Martin. Thank you very much. So the editor at HarperCollins knew of my work and her team wanted to do something on Opal Lee because she had become so popular in this short span of time during the month of June of 2020. And so she was like, well, who could we get to write a picture book biography about grandmother Opal Lee? And she remembered my book, Memphis Martin and the Mountaintop. And so her team contacted me and asked me if I would consider writing the book. And at the time, my specialty is the American civil rights movement. Okay. okay. That's specialty. I'm not very, um, I, I'm not very well read in the American slavery history, but I accepted the challenge because I knew that writing a book about Opal Lee and writing a book about Juneteenth, I would now have to be informed about what happened during American slavery, what happened during the civil war. Right. And yes. I accepted the challenge. I wrote the book being mindful that I was now about to write a book for small kids about slavery. That is a difficult task. So Absolutely. what I did was, I was like, okay, how can I make this book engaging, inspiring, and fun, right? So I wrote it as a very long, it's written like a long poem that is done in the tradition of church, like a call and response. And respond. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did because I want children to understand the history of American slavery. I want them to understand the importance of Juneteenth. And, and I want them to see 
in order to inspire them to do brave things and to be brave, they have to see examples of people doing brave things. So I wanted them to see Opal Lee as an example of bravery and courage. And so, but I wanted to put her life in, in, a, in a context that was not like she was born on April 8th and then she died and then she did this and that. I wanted it to be something that was fun, moving. <laughs> catchy absolutely okay. something that was relevant fun and engaging for them yes ma'am so let's go into the book read we've been talking and i'm sure the the people watching they want to hear the book if you haven't purchased it already but let's go into this book read y'all enjoy this book as uh, miss alice reads this book and gather your questions so we can have a discussion subsequent to the book read okay hold on and the name of the book is opal lee and what it means to be free the the true story of the grandmother of juneteenth it is available wherever books are sold awesome Good morning, everyone. I am Alice Faye Duncan, and I am the author of Opal Lee and What It Means to Be Free, the true story of the grandmother of Juneteenth, which is a celebration of Miss Opal Lee, a freedom fighter for a new generation, just like you. Happy Juneteenth Jamboree. Come and join the fun. Opal Lee waved to her great grandson as he barreled across the park. He zipped past lines of picnic tables covered with platters of barbecue, baked beans, tomato tarts, and raspberry cobbler. He hurried past a leaping choir draped in purple robes. He danced a jig with cowboys playing fiddles, but they did not stop his flow. Buddy ran to the blooming tree where Opal Lee held court. Her braided hair was a silver crown. Her eyes were twinkling stars. Great grandeur, Buddy called. Tell us a Juneteenth story. Opal Lee raised her face to the sun as memories of yesteryear filled her vision. When she had been a Texas bud, like the children at her feet, and just like children like you, Granddaddy Zach told freedom stories on his wooden porch. As Opal Lee remembered his words, she lifted her hands and cheered. Juneteenth means freedom, and now it's story time. Then Opal Lee began. Once upon a blazing sun, black bodies were bought and sold like cattle. Black men plowed the fields, but were not allowed to own the land. Black women cooked the food, but were not allowed to feast on the roast and ribs from the master's table. Black children cleaned the one-room schoolhouses, but they were not allowed to read or write. Earning and learning were against the law. American slavery was a, say it with me, thief. American slavery dragged on like a plague until January 1, 1863. That's when President Lincoln wielded courage and raised his feathered pen. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Say that with me, Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, he did. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation with a mighty stroke. Glory, glory, glory. Freedom was dazzling news like a bright starry night. However, Texas was big and many miles away from Mr. Lincoln. White masters defied his words. Black bodies remained in bondage. They plowed, they cooked, they cleaned. Freedom did not ring through Texas in 1863. Then during the toiling times in Lone Star State, for two years passed, five months passed, 18 days passed. They were very weary days. Then finally, 
the word of the emancipation came and joy jumped up on dancing feet in the Gulf town of Galveston. The year was 1865. The day was June 19th. Gordon Granger marched through Galveston with Union Army troops. The general raised his booming voice and spoke these righteous words. He said, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the Emancipation Proclamation from the executive of the United States, all enslaved are free. Opal Lee danced in a circle as she remembered. She said, freedom, hope, and joy divine. Juneteenth means it's freedom time. Can you imagine the excitement? Say that with me. Freedom, hope, and joy divine. Juneteenth means it's what? Juneteenth means it's, that's right, freedom time. Singing, feel the air. Happy tears rolled down like rain. Black families leaped through cotton fields and played tambourines. It was a day of jubilee, perfect for Texas barbecue, watermelon, and sweet potato pie. Delicious delights they had been denied during their servitude. Opal Lee told the children, Remember my words for safekeeping. Remember what I say. Juneteenth is bigger than Texas singing or dancing bands. Juneteenth is freedom rising and freedom is for everyone. Juneteenth is you and me. As the children clapped and cheered, Buddy tugged her sleeve. He said, great grandeur, what was Juneteenth like when you were a kid? Opal Lee unwrapped another story. She said, blacks and whites lived separately when I was a child. Jim Crow signs littered old Fort Worth in every public place. Black families were banned from Forest Park Zoo, except one day of the year on Juneteenth, we could picnic party and ride the Ferris wheels. Can you imagine that? That at one time in, in Fort Worth, Texas, Black people could only visit the, the zoo one day a year, and that was Juneteenth. Opal Lee said, I hated that zoo. I loved it too. The birdhouse was my favorite. Buddy groaned and shook his head. The old days don't sound so good. Good and bad work together, like the sun and rain. I spent good days on my grandfather's porch, reading poetry books. His farm was my playground. I ran across the fields and climbed the tallest oak. Glory, glory, glory. Some memories are chocolate sweet, but some memories cut and bruise. My saddest season started on Juneteenth day. It was 1939 and I was 12 years old. An angry mob with flaming sticks burned my family's brand new house. Their broken minds and evil hearts were so afraid of black progress. Something like today. The police made no arrests. Something like today and my family moved away. And yet the embers burn, that fire still lives in me. I learned a big lesson that Juneteenth day. Freedom is a golden coin and struggle, struggle makes it shine. And no matter how long it takes for freedom to stretch across the land, as for me and as for you, we've got to keep on teaching. We've got to keep on reaching. We've got to keep on walking. We've got to keep on talking. We've got to keep raising our voices on the prairie and the mountaintop until, say it with me, freedom rings. The children lifted their hands in praise. They yelled, freedom, hope, and joy divine. Juneteenth means it's that's right, freedom time. 
Opal Lee winked and chuckled. I think now it's time for barbecue, strawberry cake, and red Juneteenth punch. Glory, glory, glory. Buddy cheered and waved his hands. When he bounced up to leave, Opal Lee hugged him tightly. Then, just like birds in flight, all the children flocked into her arms. Opal Lee studied their shining faces. They were black, they were brown, they were bronze, they were gold, they were tan, they were white. Some had freckles. Opal Lee rested against the blooming tree and whispered in the wind. She said, remember my words for safe, to safekeeping. Remember what I say. Freedom is for everyone. Juneteenth is what? Juneteenth is you and me. The True Story of the Grandmother of Juneteenth, my book, Opal Lee and What It Means to Be Free. Wonderful. I told you all that you would enjoy that book. Everyone, whether you are a child, an adult, whether you are a senior citizen, we can all learn from this book. Miss Alice, you talked about in the beginning how this book is a biography, meaning it is a true story. These events actually happen. So I'm assuming that you had an opportunity to sit down with the primary source um, and not a secondary source. And I'm sure you have probably used some secondary sources, but you sat down with the primary source of this book, and that would be Opal Lee. Talk about your experience in sitting down with Opal Lee and what you actually gleaned from her as you wrote this book. Okay, so that's a very good question because I got a chance to call and speak with Opal Lee to interview her. And then I've had an opportunity to do Zoom calls with Opal Lee. And it's something very interesting. In order for Juneteenth to become a national holiday, it had to be uh, approved by Republicans and Democrats. Yes. Opal Lee comes from Texas, which you know is a majority Republican state, right? So in order for her campaign to work, it was absolutely necessary that she band people together and that she build a coalition of two uh, political parties. And so what I noticed when I was interviewing her is that she is very full of love, light, and laughter. There is nothing, there, there is nothing intimidating by her, uh, about her. She's very welcoming. She's very warm and she is always unequivocally, she is positive. So that even when it appeared that perhaps Juneteenth would not be a holiday, then she was always encouraging, always believing for the best. I guess that's what love does, doesn't it? It always believes the best. And even in the light of, the, or the wake of the George Floyd lynching, she never uh, offered disparaging words about those who could be considered the enemy. She was always prayerful. She was always finding a positive light in the dark. And so mm -hmm. that was the thing about writing the book. I wanted to make sure that it contained this really um, palpable element of a joy, right? Because that's who Opal Lee is. She is uh, joy divine. Absolutely. So I see that a common theme in this book, and it's a word that I, I saw often throughout the pages, Juneteenth mm -hmm. means freedom. 
And this past week, a matter of fact, these past three days have been quite challenging for the people of Ukraine as their freedom is being challenged. Why is it important for children to understand the significance of freedom? Something, something that everyone should be entitled to, but why is it important for children particularly to understand the significance and weight of this theme of the book, Freedom? Well, you know what Fannie Lou Hamer says, and it's the same thing that uh, Grandmother Opal Lee says, which is if, if one of us is not free, no one is free. And so what happens to children in America often is they are aloof many times to the pain and the concerns of countries where war is a constant. They, um, you know, sometimes they're oblivious to it because it's not on their television set you know, 24 hours, or it, it's not being, they're going to school in a place that is, let's say, safe enough, okay, because some schools can be unsafe, but they're going to schools in places that are safe enough. And so they get up in the morning, they have breakfast, they get dressed, they go to school, they come home, they look at TV, they do their homework. Not one are they seeing, uh, tanks, you know, our soldiers marching through the, the street. But if we, if, if, if there is someone in the, in the world who is not free and, and having to fight for liberation, that should concern all of us, right? Because we are, is, the body of Christ is what? It's one, one. right? And, um, and so that's what I did. That's what I did this week. Child, I, I I was like, look, I, I called my principal and I was like, look, I, I need us to um do an all call of a moment of silence. Uh, and we need to pray for the world for, for the world peace. We need not pray, but we need to have a moment of silence because I wanted my high school students to be cognizant and aware that there was unrest in the world and that they could contribute to peace by praying. We called it moment of silence because we were a school, but but we understood that that moment of silence was a time to pray. The, the thing about sharing books like Opalee with children is that books like that give kids a model of courage. When I want to be rich, you know what I do? I study books about, about tycoons who have given me a demonstration of how I can be rich, right? So when you want children to do brave things, when you want children to operate in courage, you show them demonstrations of the little girl in Memphis and Martin and Mountaintop, Lorraine. You show them demonstrations of Opal Lee. And you show them demonstrations of Martin Luther King. You show them demonstrations of Harriet Tubman. You show them demonstrations of, uh, you know, uh, people in the community who are who are T.O. Jones, just people in the community who are Elmore Nickelberry, people in the community who are doing brave things so that they understand that just like those people, though we all are human, feeble and frail, we are capable of doing what is right, even if we go trembling doing it. Absolutely. Um, it's a songwriter and I can't remember the name of the song, but every time there is some unjust in the community, particularly when there's another African-American male who dies at the hands of police or vigilantes, I play this song and it, it, it's the words of the song are, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. That is and, Ella Baker. Yes. That's Ella so, Baker. When I think of Opal Lee, you know, although her story came, you know, it, it was highlighted during the, the George Floyd um, lynching. It got a lot, a lot of national attention. Opalie's story of uh, Juneteenth being recognized as a federal holiday, it didn't just happen so swiftly in a month's time or in a year's time. She <laughs> believed in the story of freedom being told and she, be she believed in this day being recognized as it is so important important to African-Americans, particularly in Texas. She believed in that story of freedom being told. So she couldn't rest. And she actually walked miles and miles and miles to draw attention to this issue. But Miss Alice collected, hold on, and, and collected over almost, she collected almost 2 million uh, signatures, signatures 
in order to make it so. And this movement that that she did, like you said, it just didn't start overnight. It actually is a movement that started in the late 70s. And when she got to be like 89, she had been helping, she had been, she had been a part of that coalition in the late 70s, early 80s to make it a holiday. But when she got to be 89, and I think Donald Trump was the president and, and all of that trauma happened, I think she said enough is enough. It's like she didn't know how long she had to live, but she was going to use all her last days making sure that Juneteenth was recognized. She literally put her feet to the pavement and yes, began to did. walk for what she believed in. Yes, she did. What I, you, you, talk, you, you touched on it earlier prior to reading the book and you talked about how it's so important to make the book fun and engaging for children because children learn when it's fun and engaging. Most adults yeah, learn when stop, it's- stop, stop, stop. Also for anybody who gets the book, the book has in the back of it, cause you mentioned engaging. The book has in the back of it a recipe for a red Juneteenth punch that kids can make with parents. They can make it with grandparents or they can make it with the school teacher. You see it. Uh, they can make it with the librarian. Um, and so it, it's like it's another element of engaging kids in literacy. Also, yes. Oftentimes kids will say, well, I don't like to read. And the reason they don't like to read is because they've not had the right book or they have not encountered the right subject that inspires them. So if you have one of those kids, grandparents, parents, just keep on, keep on keeping on, just keep on taking them to the library, keep on taking them to the bookstore until you all find that right book with the, all the right um, chemistry for to, to to inspire your kid to love words so why is it important to teach children history and before you answer that question we've got to be mindful that in more recent years than previous mm -hmm. years we mm -hmm. have state legislators and governors trying to remove critical race theory from the classroom. And um, some state legislators have gone as far as compiling a list of books that are not to be included in the curriculum or read at school. Mm -hmm. And obviously a lot of people are threatened by history. People are always threatened by the truth. That's why they tried to kill Jesus because he was the truth. They were threatened by him. But if one were to ask you why your book, mm -hmm. your biography, this is mm -hmm. history. There's nothing in this story made up. It's not realistic fiction. This is truth. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted to ask you, Miss Alice, why should your book be kept in the classroom? Mm -hmm. How would you respond? Okay. The reason why you should keep my book in the classroom is because there are unscrupulous people in the world. And these unscrupulous people in the world, if you don't record what actually happened in history, they will say it did not happen. So I record these unexplored moments in history like Juneteenth, which is not very popular in, in textbooks. I, I explore these uh, unpopular topics like the assassination of Dr. King. I mean, my book, Memphis Martin and Mountaintop, was the very first picture book about the assassination of Dr. King. I do it because I know that if we don't keep a record, they will say the Holocaust never happened. If we don't keep a record, they will say, oh, uh, slavery never happened. If we don't keep a record, um, they will say that there was no conspiracy to kill Dr. King. If we don't keep a record, uh, they will say that, that Juneteenth is just a holiday about uh, Kool-Aid and barbecue. And it's not, it's a holiday about reflecting on how far we've come from being enslaved and how far we still need to go because freedom still has not come yet. I mean, it, freedom is an ongoing, an ongoing process. So we, I'm keeping records. I'm mm -hmm. keeping receipts because if we don't, again, the unscrupulous will say 
it never happened. Another thing is this, in order, if you are going to have an intelligent electorate, that means if you are going to have children who are going to grow up and to know and understand how to vote, who they need to vote for, and not to listen to everything that is coming through the airwaves, you've got to have a kid that is a good critical thinker. How do we make critical thinkers? We make critical thinkers by making sure they are well read. Absolutely. That's I agree it. with you. So you you make history digestible for kids. Um, and, it, and it was a lesson learned in my house a couple of weeks ago, particularly on Martin Luther King, King Jr. Day. weekend. Martin Luther the King Day. And in our house, we always read a book as it relates to MLK on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. We do some service that weekend. And my husband and I, before we even had kids, we always tried to watch a documentary or a movie um, that will motivate us. On this particular weekend in January, my husband and I decided to watch the movie Selma. And um, I have a seven-year-old and I, my son just turned nine on February the 9th. Mm -hmm. And the kids were running around the house because they had done their service that day and they had also read something that day and they were just running around the house playing. But when that scene from the Pettus Bridge came up, I told my children to come into the room and I said, watch this, watch this. This, this is what they did. Watch this. This is what they did. Now, my daughter, my daughter was born in Memphis, so she she's straight. She looked at it and you can see the fury beginning to well up in her chest. But my son, he's not from Memphis. Well, he is from Memphis, but he was born in Connecticut. He began to tear up and he burst into a cry and he said, I don't like this. Miss Alice, why is it important to make the story digestible for the kids to understand where they are not uh, frightened or scared, but also make it digestible where they can be inspired to do more? Okay, so like how long have you been, how long have you been, we have, how long have we how long have we been black all of our lives and how long have most of us who have come from a church experience have we been listening to the calvary story all of our lives the calvary story is the most tragic story that you are ever going to experience but when you experience there is the sadness leads to redemption the sadness leads to action. And so therefore you cannot, I can make my story openly, which is what I've done. I've made it, I've given it that element of joy, but it is not without that somber reflection. And you cannot have sun without rain. It's no way, it's no way we can encounter the tragedy and the triumphs of history and just we just can't have we just can't have all sunshine there's no way around calvary in order to get the crown baby you got to have the cross so, absolutely no way it's no way i can i can obliterate book banners book banners it's no way that we can we cannot uh address the hard parts of it because in order to get to the good parts freedom liberation you've got to cross the hard parts and so you know we just can't we can't wipe out the uh, uh, the trying part because without the cross there is no crown and that that's the way it goes in history too you know um there's no way I, I can't make it just can't be tap dancing all the time. Absolutely. You can't get to the promised land without the struggle. Right. <laughs> even if the struggle takes you 40 years, you right. can't get to that promised you land can't. without the, the struggle. And, and, so that, and that's the thing. When the book banners are saying, well, my little white child is feel, feeling guilty about being um, about being white. 
Well, look, you just told me a story about two little black children at your house having a very visceral experience when they're watching folks on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. So I'm saying, like, do I do I take out all the history books because reading about the assassination of King is going to break my heart? No, I read about the assassination of King so that my child will be very aware that that spirit of evil still lives but it also can be overcome because didn't Absolutely. my Lord deliver what Daniel, he delivered us from slavery. He delivered us from Jim Crow. He delivered us from poverty. I mean, so, so God is still in, in, you know, in, in the blessing business. So, um, so yeah, that's my response for that. But you said something very, I know it's almost time for us to go, but you said something that we have to address. Okay. So you see this book here? Everybody and their mama and their daddy need this new book. It's called Evicted, The okay. Struggle for the Right to Vote. The Holy Spirit made you mention Selma because right here in Memphis, 50 miles away from Memphis in 1959, there was a voting rights struggle. And it was, it was in Fayette County. It was called the Tent City Movement where black farmers dared to vote and then white landowners evicted them off the land and they made them, the, the, uh, the black farmers had to live in tents for like three years. Here is the thing. Follow me. Hear me with your good ear if you can. Black Tennessee farmers in 1959 made it possible for John Lewis and those folks with SNCC to walk that Edmund Pettus Bridge that your children wept about. Without these farmers in Fayette County, John Lewis and his SNCC friends would not have infiltrated the, the, uh, the rural South to start a voting rights movement. They were inspired to go to the rural South John Lewis and his friends because of the farmers in Fayette County who lived in those tents. Without John Lewis and his friends on the Selma, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you do not get the 1965 signing of the Voting Rights Act. What people in Memphis don't realize is the reason why, the reason why um, Memphis is such I guess it's so important to American history is because so many of the American civil rights moments, those pivotal moments have happened right here near us. We are almost like the epicenter. Yes. Uh, who is it? Uh, Emmett Till, a few miles away from Memphis. Um, Dr. King, the assassination, a few miles, I mean, in Memphis. Uh, uh, Meredith integrating integrating Ole Miss, a few miles, 60 miles away, Little Rock, Little Rock children, a few miles away. Uh, and then that monumental moment, the Voting Rights Act uh, that was signed in 1965, the idea, the germ for that, that movement started 50 miles away, Memphis, you got to get the book. You got to get the book, Evicted, The Struggle for the Right to Vote. And the words- Y'all see that, get the book, Evicted. You got it's to something get that book. our children can learn from oh, considering. Alice, right. You got to get the book. And in the words of my mother, my mother says all the time, she says, Alice, really, really, Alice, really, Alice, these books that you're writing, Alice, they're really for adults. They're really for adults. I was like, no, mother, they're for children. And they're for the adults <laughs> who didn't get the information when they were children. I agree with you. And, and it's important for our children to comprehend the concepts and the themes of your books, because this is something that affects them. Believe it or not, I know a lot of people have become complacent. Voting rights, it's still on the table. <laughs> you know, no, just, it's just, been gutted. It's been just gutted. a couple of weeks ago, our state legislator just called themselves just redistrict, redistricting and they took yeah, our okay. whole black district as if we don't exist. And, so and, and, and who was, right? was anybody in the street? And that's the thing. The thing is, I am not a marcher. I am a writer. But somebody going to have to march. Just like those farmers in, in Fayette County sacrificed homes. They lived in tents, y'all, for two years. But Black folks now not ready to go live in tents. They're not ready to, to have to lose the credit card. They're not ready to you know, lose the house. They're not ready to walk off the job because now we're so married to the system. We're so married to the money. We, now we have so much that we like, I can't quit. I can't sacrifice that. But somebody's going to have to sacrifice because now 
your voting right you have less voting rights now as a black person than you had in 1965. they're chipping away at it you can't even give someone water at some voting polls now in tennessee you better talk you better talk so we need to be cognizant of some of those and rights that they children. are chipping away at right and, and i and need y'all yes to be cognizant and, and of not just what's going on in dc but what's going on in nashville because what's right. going on in nashville is a disgrace an it's, it's absolute gonna disgrace it's got, and and here's the thing your children who are not voting age their voting rights are being gutted as we speak so i say share my books with them so that they will understand that there is something more important and at stake right now than what kind of tennis shoes they wearing what kind of hair they getting what kind of nails they got what kind of car y'all driving what kind of house you living in what they wearing i mean there is something more at stake for the children they need to be aware that their freedom is the target and they need to be able to articulate it talk about it and live conscientiously so that they are walking in excellence so that they can be the adults who are going to be in power to make sure that freedom does ring and rings for everyone we have a question everyone. from one yes. of our viewers what is that question miss monica Miss Monica, we can't hear you. Clarence, can we take Miss Monica off of mute and put her in the show? Thank Here you. We go. There you go, Miss Monica. Yes, we have a question from Miss Natasha. She says, why do we feel we have to dumb down things for children? They're so much smarter than we give them credit for. Can we get an answer for that? Well, I, I, I teach in school. And so what happens in school now is testing is a, is a billion dollar testing if you've heard of spring testing end of the year testing college testing it's a billion dollar you know industry and so therefore now in schools when school starts soon as the teacher gets to the class and the kids get get to the class it's really all about we've now got this curriculum for the test and let us teach it so there is no room in public ed uh, for creativity of instruction and for even children learning independently what they wish to learn. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really not the teacher that is participating in this dumbing down. It's corporations and districts who are, who are surrendering to, um, you know, testing, which is a very, capital it's a lucrative business yeah and, and 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 yeah and so you know but that's a whole nother painful conversation that we would all be weeping and crying about if if we start unraveling that onion i think we also need to remember that our children are cognizant we think they're not they're cognizant of their surroundings they're cognizant of what's going on in the world i listened to my son talking to his friends the other day and his front friend, friend blurted out belarus is on russia's side and i'm like oh my goodness you guys are nine so <laughs> our kids are cognizant and i think when we become we become adults because of our own trauma because of our own pain we want to shield our children so we we don't think they are that intelligent because we're trying to shield them from a lot of the true facts and our children they know what is going on, which brings me to my point, y'all, because we're at 48 minutes tomorrow. Tomorrow, our worship service is taking into account children of the movement. That's what our worship service is about tomorrow. As we close Black History Month tomorrow, we are highlighting the children that paved the way. Ruby Bridges, Emmett Till, the Greensboro Four. A lot of these kids didn't in, intend on being in the civil rights movement, but they knew they, they either knew they had to be a part of it because their parents were telling them like Ruby Bridges, you're going to go to the school or some of them like Emmett Till ended up sacrificing, sacrificing their life. But his life sparked a movement that yes. changed this world. So tomorrow tune in. I guarantee you, whether you are a child or an adult, you will enjoy tomorrow's worship experience highlighting children of the movement it is a skit written by myself yours yours truly and miss flo roach will be introducing a skit as well oh, please join in. Oh, 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 girl. Yay! you do 
not want to miss it. This conversation has been so wonderful and it has blessed my soul. It has planted seeds in me to do Thank more. You. It has planted seeds Thank in me. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation, Minister Monica. Thank you for the invitation, Minister Turner. Uh, look, uh, February is coming back again in 2023. Please invite me back. I promise you I will. You all get this book. Don't wait until Black History Month to purchase this book. Like me, you can it's ask Monica, I'm always looking for books by black authors, but purchase this book. But before we leave, before we leave, now what is yet to come? Are, are you gonna write a book on Judge um, Brown Jackson who was just nominated by Joe no, Biden? No, 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 stop. Listen, listen, with, hear me with your good ear. The next book that I am working on, uh, it's going to be released in 2023. It's called, it's called, uh Coretta it's the life and times what's it called Coretta's journey the life and times of Coretta Scott King awesome. and it's a book for kids yes it's a book for kids but I'm talking about the mantle of prophecy uh the mantle of protest and the obstacles of patriarchy that Coretta Scott King had to survive in order to be the light that she was and so, yes, it's a children's book because oftentimes when we hear about Coretta Scott King, we think, oh, Dr. King's little Mona Lisa wife. But there was so much more to her life. She literally was, you know, the story of Moses and, and uh, Nun, and they're holding up Moses's hands while he's fighting. Coretta Scott King is the armor bearer. She is the one that was holding up Martin's arms so that he could continue to fight. And, um, and so it's 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 a book that will allow us to see Coretta in a whole new light of strength. Um, and it's also talking about that cosmic union because what they have is a cosmic relationship that is not of this world, but it is of something divine and holy. Go to my website, alicefayduncan.com. You can see an excerpt from that book. You can see the other books that I am that I have written and um also if you're if there's anybody here who is interested in writing uh go to my website alicefayduncan.com i have a free writing workshop for kids are, are free to participate and adults are free to participate uh it will be during the juneteenth weekend of 2022 thank you for inviting me to be with you it's been a thank blast. you so much i look forward to what is yet to come in 2023 with Coretta's book. I hope you're going to write a book on the first black woman to be uh, nominated to the Supreme Court. I'm excited to hear her story because she has an interesting story. Yes. Um, let, well, I, and I'm sure she, we have to wait to see how her uh, confirmation hearings roll out because you do know that our brothers and sisters in Congress can be quite entertaining. And I'm sure you'll have, we'll, we'll all learn something from the experience that they're getting ready to put her through. But nevertheless, we appreciate you and we honor you for having enough courage to tell the story to children, not just for the sake of them reading, but they will learn, they will be inspired. They will hopefully be somehow provoked to do something different in a world that is constantly changing. But in a world where, like you said, evil tries to take over. Nevertheless, we are constantly asking God to deliver us from evil. So thank you because your books, every one of them, and the ones that are yet to come, are delivering us from an evil that this world has tried to overshadow us with. Your books are enlightening to a dark world. Thank hey, you, thank you, thank you. Before we end, can I give you a poem from my book, Memphis Martin and the Mountaintop? Uh, Please do. You, all right, if you all would repeat after me, and I know I can't hear you, so I can't hear you, so we'll just do the call and response, okay? Okay, Minister Turner? All right, repeat after me. Dream big. Dream big. Walk tall. Walk tall. Be strong. Be strong. March on. March on. Don't quit. Don't quit. Never stop. Never stop. Climb up. Climb up. Climb up. Climb up. The mountaintop. The mountaintop. Thank you, Mississippi Boulevard. God bless you all. Thank you. Keep climbing, my sister. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.